Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast, where we explore your hidden thoughts and desires, revealing your greatest drop the mic moments. Now, here's your host, Art Costello. Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast. Today, I am thrilled and honored to have Julie Steelman on the show. Julie is an adventurer, a master photographer, <laughs> actually award winning master photographer, just does beautiful work. But really her story about as a toddler, Julie dreamed of traveling to Africa and knew the only way she could make that happen was to make her own money. This ignited her quest to create financial freedom and have cash flow for life. She earned her way out of the corporate world at the young age of 47 by generating over $100 million in online advertising revenue. Julie is the CEO and founder of the Financial Freedom Institute and is known as to her clients as a financial visionary, wealth coach, and selling expert. Her intriguing and innovative approach to helping to pioneer entrepreneurial women change their financial destiny has resulted in her clients being able to design, sustain business models, generating healthy cash flow, and building wealth. Julie authored and highly praised book, The Effortless Yes, and has a 25-year career iconic corporate brand sales. She uses her master's degree in spiritual psychology to translate her award-winning wildlife photography into teaching metaphors. I can't say enough about this woman. She, (laughs) She really has done much, traveled much, and we have so much that we can cover from so many areas that I have a feeling this is going to be one of those kind of things where we we end up doing another show. Julie, welcome to the show. And thank uh, you. Tell us how this all started for you. Wow. Well, it's always so interesting to hear your own bio, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is. You're kind of like, oh, stop. <laughs> You know, it started for me as a really little kid. I remember being six, seven years old. Every Sunday night, we would watch Mitchell of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And you'll laugh because I know you're with me. We were back in the day when it was, you know, there were only 13 channels and you had to actually get up and go over to the TV. (laughs) There were no voice remotes, right? And, um, I'm watching these videos of leopards and lions and zebras and giraffes. And I just, my little kid heart was transported to Africa. And I knew that no matter what, I needed to go to Africa before I died. And as a little kid, you know, living in Chicago, it felt like this super foreign, huge dream that was very unlikely to happen. And in my brain, my being a problem solver, I started to think about how am I going to make that happen? And, you know, over time, I'm realizing that I live in a family that doesn't have passports. They're not risk takers. They don't leave their zip code. And I'm like, there's no way it's going to happen that way. And somehow I made the decision that I needed to make and create my own money and my own time so that I was free to go to Africa. I always am oriented around my core value is freedom. And so I'm always oriented around how do I create freedom for myself? Meaning how do I have choices? How do I get to do what I want to do when I want to do it? So, you know, go through the years, graduate high school, go to college. And in college, I had one of those, what you like to call the shower epiphany (laughs) moment, you know, where I was living a life working at a bar, saving my tips so I could pay down my maxed out credit card, right? We can all relate to this. (laughs) And then I felt like for 30 minutes a month, I had some financial freedom and I'd go do what I want and buy what I want, max out my credit card again. And it just kept going like that, right? Kept repeating, repeating. And one day I'm walking down the sidewalk and I'm thinking to myself, how can I make more money? And then it's like, not really, it's not really a reality because I'm a college student, I maxed out on time, I'm working double shifts. And then the question became, how can I keep more money? And that became one of my core foundational 
belief shifts around money that I would love to talk more about with your audience and this idea of freedom, you know, is how are we looking at things? And that was one of my epiphanies. And so when I graduated college, I decided to take a career in sales because I would have the most direct impact over my own income. And as I was thinking about corporate America, I'm like the idea of sitting in a cubicle outside someone's office in December, they'd decide if I get a four and a half percent raise wasn't going to work for me. (laughs) You know, and I was all about, I don't want to be in the office. So, you know, this, you can see how that decision as a little kid kind of created this pathway. And so eventually I retired financially free following this path. And my late husband and I moved to Hawaii and our first trip was to Africa And we just kept going back. And then he died very suddenly and unexpectedly. And, you know, that's when I realized how many people ride the edge of financial disaster, like they aren't prepared for these mega life changes that you don't foresee coming. We were prepared. I was prepared. But what spawned me forward and the only thing that made me feel good during that deep grieving time of the loss of this amazing partner was to go to Africa. And that's when I, I my photography really started to amplify. And I met someone who is like my second father and he's been a mentor to me. And now I'm an award-winning photographer because of it. And I think, you know, one of the things I would love to share is that these dreams that you have, you know, throughout your life, If we surrender to the leadership of those, they're the thing that lead us into the freedom that we want to have in whatever that way that is for us. The need to have closure in any given situation is sheer human nature. And when it comes to romantic relationships, this desire skyrockets. Has your previously failed relationship left you in immense pain? It's not uncommon for people to shy away from a new relationship after their first one fails miserably. The fear of the unknown makes them hide in a shell to prevent any future heartbreak. Relatable? Despite wanting to love and be loved, you can't take the plunge if your mind and heart are still locked somewhere in the past. Maybe you aren't aware of the power of releasing the past, or perhaps you don't know how to do it. Art Costello in his online course teaches the art of moving on from bad places to happier, more stable ones. This course can change your life for good, helping you beat all kinds of negativity on the road to eternal bliss. Sign up now before the gloominess gets the better of you at expectationacademy.com. Yeah, do you think that it's partly in that that it's actually part of the path? You know, as long as we listen to the intuitive part of ourselves and listen to our gut feeling, you know, because I, I don't know if you know much about my story. But, you know, from nine years old, I had to figure out everything on my own. It was was just pretty much left abandoned. So, yeah, you know, I I think that there's a commonality in what our core values, how we, how we developed. You talked to something that touched me. You said one of your core values is freedom, you know, and I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever thought about your core expectations? Oh, that's such a good question. (laughs) Yeah, you know, I ha- I trip over it all the time. <laughs> you know, kind of that things are supposed to be smooth and easy, right? And if they're not, then somehow I'm not doing it right, right? You know, so there's that whole, I mean, we could talk for hours about the Buddhist belief system around that's the whole uh, mechanism that keeps suffering in place, right? <laughs> for me... My core expectations are integrity, compassion, and I just went blank on the third one. Oh, love. I'm sorry, the most love. one of the most important ones. Yeah. So those are my three. And that's how I live in everything I do. So and I suspect that you being freedom wise, I mean, I've always wanted to be free. Uh, yeah. I started selling uh, Christmas cards in July as a seven year old. <laughs> going up and down the street <laughs> where we wow. live knocking on doors knocking on doors and that started me yeah. on 
really understanding that the only way that you ever have control of your life is to be able to financially take care of yourself. It gives you the ability to take care of others. Yeah. And when I say others, it doesn't only mean family, but we have you know, charities and everything else that we can take care of, you know, whether it be churches or whatever your choice is, you know, but it gives us that ability. And there's a a certain amount of freedom that comes with it, but more so the internal happiness. And I think that that's what comes out in your photography. Because when I look at your photography, I feel it. I feel it. And, you know, Mm -hmm. whether it's animals or you know, landscape, it doesn't matter. There's a gentleness to it, but yet a, almost like a contrast of this can be over here and this can be here. And, you know, there's so much to take in, in your photography. Mm, Um, Detail, detail, maybe that's a better way to put it. Mm. So I have a friend that is an award-winning photographer, but he's passed away last year. He's actually in my high school class, Charlie Alzheimer. I don't know if you heard him. He does uh, white-tailed deer specifically. Wow. He's photographed. I mean, he's won all kinds of awards. And just, it's amazing. Photography has always intrigued me. For me, it has always been this expression that you could have. And you have to have very detailed eyes for it. And I'm colored blind as can be. So I don't (laughs) see colors. It's like, you know, I often wonder, you know, what colors do you see versus what I see? But anyway, going back to the path, though, the path that none of this would have happened hadn't you had the internal fortitude to look within yourself and make these realizations. Do you think that that can be developed in people? Do you think people develop it? I actually think yes. I actually think it's almost what we're here to develop. And when you asked about core expectations... (laughs) I was sort of interpreting it a little bit differently. And I would say that my core aspirations are really for peace and harmony and communion, you know, and that's what it's like the ongoing, never ending quest, so to speak. Right. Mm -hmm. And this path is, it is a path of self-realization, a path of soul actualization, if you will, And I think the most important thing is that we were planted with a seed of what we most yearn for because following the quest to that is what will actualize us being our best selves and our most selves and our most self-expressed self. And I think we live in a culture and a society and a time in a world where all of the impressions upon us are about looking without to reference what's important. And I think the most powerful part of my journey, and mine just happened to be around money. Some people's is around love. Some people's is around health. Some people's is around career. Is that I self-reference my power. I self-reference where I'm going and what's the next step on the journey. and. Like that's the most important part of being free is being unbound from, yeah, there's the money and you can have the choices and all that. But at the end of the day, it's about being unbound from the impressions of negative beliefs or inherited belief systems that cost us our our life force or our livelihood or what we want to do in life. And we're here just like, you know, Oz behind the curtains, pushing the bells and the levers and moving them and right. And then coming home and then like having a beer or whatever and thinking, is this all there is, you know? And I think that the problem is that it's outer referenced and being free to me is being unbound from having to be beholden to what society or family or anybody else thinks I should be doing. I I happen to agree. And I think that that in itself speaks volumes to you to living to your self expectations, because it doesn't matter what anyone else in this world expects of you. It doesn't. You know, because you've got to be authentic to yourself. And that's where I believe that true happiness lies. That's why I teach managing your expectations, because people are so bound. 
I call, I have a, in my book, I talk about a, a term that I use, collective diminished expectations. And I got interested in that because I have Jewish blood in me. My yeah. great grandmother was Jewish and turned Catholic to marry my grandfather. And I had a interest in the Holocaust from a the perspective yeah. of how did they convince, how did anyone convince other than by sheer power, you know, by authority, yeah. how did they convince the German people in general to assassinate and kill right. millions of people? And what I came up with was this term called collective diminished expectations. The Third Reich in their prime, the German population that the Jews had no value. And when no one has value, you disrespect them. It becomes easy to diminish their purpose in life to exactly what they did, line them up and massacre and annihilate yeah. a whole group of people. Yeah. But the same techniques were used in a different way to enslave African-Americans. You know, yes. Somebody has to agree to it, meaning yes. of the whole process. And it's either the population that is going to benefit from it and that was what yeah. the slave owners benefited from the slaves being enslaved. You know, I just have all kinds of thoughts because I wonder how so many people couldn't fight back and couldn't, yeah. you know, what was the dominance over the slaves other than pure authoritarian, you know, holding arms and, and holding them at bay. But how do you get a village to come to be able to get to that point to be controlled? without fighting back. And you have to diminish the expectations of that group to the point where they become puppets. You know, I think this isn't far from what I believe is happening in our current society, honestly. And it's, I think, large group think is very dangerous because people lose themselves. And this idea, I love how you're framing this idea of diminished collective expectations, it starts to then turn and become a justification exactly. for behavior, right? Exactly. That you would never, if you were really in your heart and aligned with your soul and your truth, that you would never do without being in part of a collective that's saying and justifying certain ways of being and behavior. I think it's extremely dangerous um, it's proven to be so in the past, you know, that's really cult mentality. And oftentimes at the head of those are, you know, a personality that's really good as a dark magus, right? Mm -hmm. They're really good at selling this point of view. They're really good at walking through a door of people's vulnerabilities and making them perceive things in a particular way. Exactly. And I think that, I think we're, I didn't really don't like to talk about politics, but, you know, I think that we're standing at one of those thresholds potentially. Oh, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, it's, you know, these next six months, you know, well, today yeah. is super Tuesday or two, whatever yep. they call it, or Here we are. super Wednesday or whatever it is. And people are out there that have followed not what their belief system is that for their personal happiness, but what that of a yeah. collective group. And it doesn't matter if you're left or right. It goes both ways. That you're, you know, a true democracy would be people going to the polls and voting their heart, voting yeah. their heart, not right. voting because of a party or anything. right. You know, and being that we're on this rampage, I'll let here we go. Right, I'll let go on this one. <laughs> You know, I think that every American politician should denounce their party affiliation and get back to doing what their heart says right instead of what the party says right and what, what all these things. We, the people, would be a lot better off and we would see a whole lot different country. Yeah. You know, we, there's, yeah. I mean, there's such economic influence on lobbyists or from lobbyists on politicians. Yes. That's got to stop. We've got to get back to basics. It's always going back to basics. I know. Yeah. You know, without, without a good foundation, we have nothing, you know, without a good, you're right. And I think we're all extremely susceptible to being in collusions 
the end group agreements that might not align with what's really true for us if we're not in our own power. And for me, being in your own power, I don't mean force. I mean, being in your own truth and being unapologetic and boundaried enough to hold it, regardless of what's going on around you and stopping the people pleasing, that's freedom. It is, absolutely. And if we're not solving something, then we're kind of part of the collusion directly or indirectly. You know, the women's pay gap in corporate there's a large percentage of women that are in HR in corporate America, right? They're in the human resources department. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, we're at a day and age when women have to stop being in collusion with the pay gap. They have to know what their male counterparts get paid and they have to start negotiating and owning their value and being able to articulate that, right? Instead of just going along with the flow because they're afraid they won't get a job or they'll lose an opportunity if they speak up, right? It's like, and I was in corporate, I got paid the same or more than guys, but you know, I'm not trying to belabor the Mm -hmm. pay gap point. I'm just trying to say a lot of our problems in a society come from that we're not in our own personal power. And so we go into collusion over certain things that typically diminish one group or another. Slavery, though Mm -hmm. we're all in collusion about that. Mm -hmm. We make judgments based not on what our sense of right or wrong is, but the right or wrong of what others are telling us it should be. I mean, or whether we're, I think think it's even deeper. It's like where you think that our belongingness is at stake. Hmm sense of belonging. That's a very interesting. And I, I think there, yes, you're right there. You know, I think that when we feel ostracized out of a group, we'll yeah. almost do anything to feel part of the group yeah. if we really want to want to be it. Maybe that's why I'm such a loner. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I ended up, I end up being more of a loner than I ever wanted to be. But I think, you know, that's what has made street gangs work is you've got kids that are don't have a deep sense of family and sense of belonging and you know they they get sold a bill of goods that they will and they'll be part of it and protected and included right and okay now go rob that car or go shoot that guy or go sell those drugs and it's like these, these scenarios aren't any different from who we are as individuals. And I think it's partly why people get stuck in not having financial freedom for themselves. There's more than enough money on the planet for everybody to have more than enough. There's more than enough food on the planet for everybody to have more than enough. And what we need is a shift in our perspectives and who we are And step away from old archetypal frameworks, right? Like the president of the United States, a lot of people are still plugged into that archetypally as though that's your father, that's your savior. They're going to take care of you. They're going to pay your bills when you retire, right? They're going to take care of you, your medical care, and on and on and on and on, right? Well, now it's going to be pay for your college education just to get there. Right. And we can't, we can't like, I don't think we can be that flippant with how we are with the frameworks and the systems. I have to think we have to be really self-resourced and reliant. It doesn't mean lone wolfing, Mm -hmm. but it means really taking a stand for you creating your own freedom in life, regardless of what happens with politics or society or anything else, or your husband dropping dead of a heart attack very unexpectedly and you not having anything in place. We did. I was fortunate, but I know a lot of women who don't. Well, I can tell you from my experience, I can yeah. tell you a man, when I lost my wife to ovarian cancer 13 years ago, we, I'm so sorry. we were sitting financially very good place. I mean, it wasn't the best of everything that we had you know, it had been better at times, but that's the cycle of, of how things go. Yeah. But medical bills, I mean, I made a promise to my wife that I would pay all of our medical bills, no matter what. She was a nurse and she wanted the doctors paid, the hospitals paid, everybody paid. And I pretty much lost everything that I ever thought was going to wow. be my, yeah. my thing. But you know what? I didn't give up. 
You know, it took me three years to get my behind in gear. You know, I grieved really hard for three years. But then once I started coming out of it, you know, then I started rebuilding. You know, that's the key to it is that anybody can have the dream. And when I say the dream, the dream can vary. The dream doesn't have to be being Bill Gates or Michael Dell or Jeff Bezos or whoever. It doesn't, you don't need to be the wealthiest person no. on the planet. Maybe living your dream is having a roof over your head, three meals a day, family yep. that's taken care of, and you get do your vacations when you want to, and you get to do yep. the things. That's all right. That can be a dream. Yep. But to not have a dream at all and not to go after it, or even to have a dream and then not pursue it. It's a choice you make. And you've got to get rid of the fear and just go for it. Can't be any worse than what's in where you're at. You know, yeah. all you've got is the is the room to go up. You know, that's that's just how I that's just how I believe. No matter what happens to me, I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna go. Yeah. It's really important to have that type of it's so dishonoring to self to have a dream and not follow it through or to avoid looking at what is the dream. And you're right. The only thing that matters is not to do it how someone else does it, but to have it be the way you want it to be and to honor that and to to go on a quest to discover how that can be so. And then what's next after that? And then what's next after that? Like then I think we're on purpose. Just like you did getting to Africa. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems, you know, in today's world, you know, back in 1967, thinking, I just dated myself, (laughs) thinking about going to Africa was actually kind of a scary thought. And talking about it today to people, it may seem like, well, that's not that big of a vision. So what? That's like going to Ireland. Big deal. You get on a plane and you go. And it's like, but it was for me and my dynamic and my scenario, but it was the catalyst that put me on a path where I was not the most likely to live financially free. We were middle class. We were fine. My dad paid for our college, greatest gift ever to not have a college loan. But I worked my butt off. After that, that my dad was really clear. After that, that's it. You buy a house, not bailing you out. You buy a car, not bailing you out. You're on your own. I gave you all the tools. Go do your thing. You're on your own. If you fail, you fail on your own. That's it. And he was really clear about that. And he was like, I got there because I intended to. And because I met a man who had the same aspirations and we pooled our resources. But the powerful thing about that is that all began with the vision of a seven-year-old who wanted to go to Africa because I was on a particular path. I wanted to create financial freedom, but I didn't even really know what I was talking about at the time. Retiring from corporate was like, you have to wait till you're 67, you know? And I was like, no, let's see if we can shave 20 years off of that. (laughs) Well, considering that time. I'm just trying to share with your listeners that it's like, there's nothing special about me. There was no setup, right? I wasn't handed that. I worked my butt off for it. The most important part was that I stayed true to accomplishing what I wanted and they can too. And anybody listening can, it doesn't even matter what age you are. Has anyone ever inspired you to discover a happier, healthier, and more fulfilled you? It is a magical experience, isn't it? Inspiration is indeed very powerful, yet it's often undermined. It can lift you from the ground to the sky in no time. Have you ever thought about returning the favor by inspiring the people around you? If you don't think you have it in you, we have good news for you. Art Costello's online course has everything you need to learn to supercharge yourself and shape your character into a powerful personality. Get ready to discover your strengths and unleash the creativity within. Don't believe it? Check it out yourself by signing up for this life-changing course at expectationacademy.com. That's expectationacademy.com. That's true. I mean, you know, people, if you want something bad enough and you're willing to work for it, 
you'll get there. And even if you don't get there, you'll be far advanced from where you were. And you learn so much along the way. I mean, you learn so much along the way when you go on these journeys. I mean, think back, you know, just going to Africa is an experience that very few Americans ever, ever have to see wildlife and to be able to photograph it. You know, I mean, that that's an honor that you worked for. And, you know, it's, you know, to me, I, I know that people get jealous over things, but to me, I think it's, it's honoring what you wanted to do and you're sharing it with me and the world is, yeah. is really a great thing. It's just great that you had the fortitude to follow, follow your dream. What was it like photographing Ugh. wildlife? Oh, am I right that I saw you with a gorilla? Photograph yes. of you with a gorilla. That, it was a silverback sleeping. Yeah, yep. That just intrigued me. That photograph. <laughs> I know, right? Can you tell us about that? Oh wow, I have a story about that. <laughs> it's my everything. It's really, really why I know that I, it's soul food for me. Being in the bush being deep off the grid with the animals, it's communion for me. Everybody asks me if I'm afraid and I'm like, don't do what I do. I am not afraid. I'm not afraid. And it's a different thing for me. And I'm not saying that I'm being smart about it, but the gorillas, that was in Rwanda, which is a phenomenal country. I've been to Africa 11 times. It'll be 12 next year. And I go at least once a year and I'm not going to stop. The more I go, the more I have to go. Anybody that wants to go, I encourage you to go as soon as possible. It's an extremely rapidly changing landscape over there in the Maasai Mara and the Serengeti, which is where the wildebeest do the great migration. There has been on the table for years, a Chinese proposal to build a road through the middle of it. If they do and they succeed in getting it through, it will change. One of the things that's happened on planet earth since before humans got here in such a dramatic way, I don't even want to think about it. So, you know, it's not, everything's not staying the same. So if you want to go see animals, go do it because all the habitats are changing rapidly. But gorillas, Rwanda is one of those countries, as you know, that the Belgians really incited genocide and put two native tribes against each other and got them to all kill each Mm -hmm. other. It was a horrific event. Now that country is extremely integrated, 51% of parliament are women, and that country is a model for what can happen. But you go through this really rural country, and you go way up to the edge of the mountaintop, and you have to scale minimum four to five hour hike, 19% grade on a path that's about as wide as your foot. And if you fall on either the left or the right, You're going to end up in stinging nettles because that's what the gorillas eat and they hurt. They sting. (laughs) So you have to wear gaiters on your legs because it will go through. And then the first time you see a gorilla, you're just like, I put my camera down and I cried. I just cried. And this idea of a missing link, I don't believe it. And the first troop we came upon, the silverback kept putting his back to us. And they would go off in the bush. And I'm like, something's going on. He's protecting the family. So we just sat and then they got more comfortable. And then they started moving around and the matriarch was carrying a deceased baby in her lap. Mm. And she was stroking its head and picking up its fingers and kissing them. I have photos of her doing this. Mm. I don't publish them because I'm on the fence about whether that's the right thing to do or not. But I tell this story. And we sat there with them and they were grieving. And you could tell by the way they were behaving that they grieved as a unit. And I was so emotionally overtaken by what I was seeing. I wish I'd shot video of it, but I didn't. And then, you know, eventually you only get an hour, which is good. They get, you know, 23 hours of their day to themselves. The silverback came over and he rubbed up against me as he walked by me. And I just sat there and I was like, somebody needs to pick me up and carry me out of here because I feel like the heart and the soul and the compassion that I saw in this animal. And so those photos, a lot of those photos that you're seeing are from that 
experience. We spent another couple of days there. It's extremely expensive. It's very arduous journey to go on, but you end up finding something about yourself from nature. You end up being reflected back to in a way that is difficult to give words to. And that's what the photography for me is about. And these animals, like to just call it an animal, I think really minimizes the being that's there. Like what being holds its baby? I learned later from the naturalist that she'll carry that baby until there's nothing left to carry. They grieve their children like that when they die. Hmm. It was profound. Wow. Don't know which direction you want your life to take? Are you sinking deep down into the pit of uncertainties day by day? So, what's the secret to leading a happy, satisfied life? It's taking matters into your own hands. But what if the matters in question are a total blur? Art Costello's Expectation Academy course aims to tell you exactly how you can get some clarity in your life. This course can be your savior on your journey to reinventing yourself. While you certainly can't plan your whole future ahead, you can definitely control twists and turns your life takes. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for this course now at expectationacademy.com. Get a chance to broaden your horizons and add meaning to your life. That's expectationacademy.com. I can imagine I get teary-eyed just listening to your story, you know? Yeah. You know, I think the primates are just incredible to watch. I don't know what it is. Uh, when I was yeah. in college, I, I did a paper uh, my senior year, and I was with uh, Jane Emery at San Diego Zoo and got to observe yeah. the primates there. And uh, I still extensively read anything that Jane Goodall puts out and everything like that. I just love it. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think it's just, I don't know. I just have a fascination with it. In that area where were you, is that where Jane Goodall did her work up in that same area where you were? Yes. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I she, she had a, depending on which trail you take, we go by right where her original cabin and office was. So yeah, she was working the Rwanda area. And, you know, one of the epic highlights of this is the men that used to poach the gorillas, now their sons are the guys that carry our camera backpacks and help us up the trail. I don't care how physically fit you are. You're going to want one of them to help you up the trail. It's a steep grade and it's a long walk. And so we give them money and they no longer poach. And so they've turned that whole thing around. It's it, telling you this is an incredible country and a role model for what's possible in not poaching natural resources and how to live and how to overcome a type of genocide that no other country has ever gone through like they have. And it's an incredible, they respect the animals now. And yeah, I think she had, she had so many complex layers of impact in her work, but most profoundly is that the Rwandans now cherish the gorillas as a natural resource. And that changes everything. Is the population coming back any, or is it still... It's stabilizing. The problem is, is that Rwanda is a subsistence farmer country. So they continue to have lots and lots of population growth and they're running out of land. So you have to actually walk through a farm and walk over a rock wall. And the rock wall is just cordoning off the top of a mountain peak, which is the gorillas territory. That mountain range is shared by the Congo and by Uganda. And the gorillas can move across that mountaintop, but that's their habitat isn't growing. So there's not a ton of habitat for a huge population explosion. Yeah, that's the that's the problem in the whole world with endangered 100%. species that you know our humanity is driving them out because we don't yep. we just keep expanding, you know. And I live in a, And Rwanda's out of land. There's no more land. See, I, we're running into the same problem, believe it or not, in Austin, Texas. You know, yeah. Austin, the influx of people here, they just keep coming and coming and coming. And, uh, you know, out at, I have a ranch yeah. about 26 miles outside of Austin. And used to be I could stand on the hilltop and look out and see maybe three or four houses over several yeah. thousands and thousands of acres of land. Now, 
I see it creeping. I can see the city lights just coming. You see the creep, yeah. Uh, just coming towards me. And I know that, you know, I don't think it'll be in my lifetime probably, but the rate it's going, it could be, you know. But that's what we're having. What's what's happening in the whole world is that we're yeah. we're getting so populated and we're killing the rainforest. I mean, uh, I just read an article on that, how the keep harvesting the timber and it's just taking the habitat away from all the yeah. all the animals and you know and the animal world has a symbiotic relationship with each other you know i mean there's prey and there's predators and and that's what keeps it all in check but when you throw man in there and he gets a weapon in yeah. his hand or whatever and you know they start eliminating yep. it you know cutting the habitat yep. down so well this has been really great julia i've just been <laughs> been thrilled and honored to hear about this. Can you tell us how people can get a hold of you? Yeah. If you're interested in conservation and wildlife, you can go to wildsacredbeauty.com. You can see a little of some of my photos there. I also recently published my first photography book and there's a lot of very deep and rich explorations into wildlife around the world in that, that also talks about their habitat and their stories, but also shares my encounters with them. And the book is called Wild Sacred Beauty. You can purchase it there. You can also go to, if you really want to have a money breakthrough, you could go to moneystorybreakthrough.com. You can find out more information about me there and you can download a little freebie and have some fun and have get unbound from some of the stuff that's keeping you from having your financial life or your money be where you want it to be based on a lot of the things that I learned across my journey. Your website? My website is juliesteelman.com, okay. which is a entrepreneurial women's wealth and entrepreneurship based information. We didn't get to talk much about your financial programs, but you know, we'll do that in the next show that, w- that we do because we're going to do, Sounds great. we're going to do another one. <laughs> We'll give people a break and we'll do one maybe another month or so with you. <laughs> that sounds awesome. This was a great conversation. I think it's so important to talk about things in this kind of way, in the sort of organic way that they go, because there's something powerful about that type of message that wants to come out and this deep need, I think, for all of us to have a sense of freedom and power over our own lives. And, you know, that shift comes from not referencing from outside of ourselves, but referencing to inside of ourselves and trusting that. It's important. Have you got any final messages you want to leave for the audience? Yeah, I think the big thing I want to leave you with is if you have that dream or yearning is to start following the leadership of that, like being boldly audacious enough to follow the leadership of that, because all that love, money, satisfaction, everything that you want is on that path, I promise, and more. And if you don't know what it is, then it's time to start getting busy and asking what it is. Great advice from Julie Steelman. I mean, it is <laughs> it has been an honor and a pleasure having you. And I'm serious about having you back on. We can keep going. So everybody, thank you for listening in today. I'm going to encourage you to contact Julie and look into her different programs. Look more so into her photography. I want you to be involved with her programs, but you'll love her photography. And you know where you can get a hold of me at expectationtherapy.com. And we're going to have Heather White take us out of here. Thanks for listening to the show. Drop us your comments and questions with what you want answered on the show. You can subscribe on iTunes and Binge Network. You can also get more information on the website, expectationtherapy.com.